Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be presenting as um, part of this opening forum. Um, I'm the lucky biologist who had a good excuse to put lots of amazing Antarctic wildlife pictures in my talk, and I haven't held back. <laughs> um, but I do want to give uh, an overview of some of the science that's happening through the Antarctic Climate and Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre, and also at the Australian Antarctic Division, particularly around assessing ecosystem change in the Southern Ocean. Um, and what I want to do is to pose and then answer um, a series of questions. Um, and the first one of those is, I guess, the fundamental question of why do we care about Southern Ocean ecosystems? So aside from um, the aesthetic and existence value of Antarctic biodiversity, um, Southern Ocean ecosystems provide us with a range of important and valuable uh, ecosystem services. So that includes provisioning services like um, fisheries. Um, so you may be aware that the fishery for Antarctic krill is increasing. Um, and in fact, potential catch limits for krill um, are equivalent to 11% of global marine fish landings. And just for, for comparison, um, current landings for Peruvian anchoveta, which is the world's largest fishery currently, are 5% of global landings. Um, the Southern Ocean is also home to a set of valuable finfish fisheries, and those together with uh, krill are managed through the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMLA. Um, ecosystems also play an important role in terms of um, climate regulation services, um, you might be aware that the Southern Ocean is responsible for about a half of the uptake of, um, the, of carbon of the world's oceans, and uh, biology and biogeochemistry play an important role in that, um, mostly driven through the microbial loop, but there's also some evidence that higher trophic levels like whales can play a role in uh, nutrient cycling. So given those values and also the fact that, as Anna highlighted, um, ecosystems are inherently complex, I guess the key challenge for research, uh, for observing and for management is in reducing uncertainty and managing risk. Um, and so a, a set of key challenges for, for management and also for society are, are asking how much of marine resources can be used sustainably um, what impacts are people having on marine resources and more generally on food webs and biodiversity? Um, are fish stocks declining? And if the answer is yes, then how fast? Uh, is the health and stability of ecosystems changing? And again, if the answer is yes, how fast and where is that happening? Um, and then finally, is ecosystem resilience or the ability to absorb change um, changing. So which stresses are most important um, in affecting resilience and are we approaching tipping points where we might see a switch to a fundamentally different ecosystem state? Okay, so given that context on um, values and, and challenges, I actually thought it might be helpful to just take a step back and ask the question, what is an ecosystem? Um, and this might seem a bit simple, but I think, again, it highlights the complexity that we're dealing with. So we can think about ecosystems um, as a set of key components and interactions, and then also a set of processes and functions. So in terms of the components, we might be interested in the dynamics of particular species, like um, Antarctic krill. We can think about diversity, which we can measure in a whole range of ways. Um, Above that level, we have uh, communities, and this is an example of um, an Antarctic benthic community. Um, and then those species and communities are using habitats. Um, and again, as Anna highlighted for the Southern Ocean, sea ice is a really important habitat that's changing quite rapidly in some regions. Um, and as I move through, I'll start to talk about um, food webs, which integrate across those components I've just mentioned and also capture Patterns of energy flow, which again are a fundamental property of ecosystems. You might be familiar with this kind of representation of a, a biomass pyramid. Um, and we can use the, the configuration of this um, fundamental pattern of, of biomass and energy flow to give us information about the overall state and also change in ecosystems. Um, and then finally, I mentioned the importance of um, nutrient cycling as a function of marine ecosystems. <laughs> 
So in ecosystem research, we have a tendency to write long lists of the things that we don't know. <laughs> um, I thought instead that I'd focus on some of the big picture things that we do know about um, ecosystem change. So this is a, um, a schematic of um, habitats, transitions and processes in the Indian sector of the Southern Ocean or East Antarctica, and that's highlighted in the box at the top. So we actually have a fairly good handle on the primary drivers of ecosystem change in this region, and those include temperature, wind, um, acidification and harvesting. But depending on the particular habitat that we're looking at, the relative importance of those drivers might be different. So whether we're thinking about um, sub-Antarctic islands and, and eddy features to the north, um, the pelagic environment, or further to the south, um, the marginal ice zone and the pack ice zone, um, or uh, benthic habitats. Uh, another important feature of this region and also other regions um, of the Southern Ocean um, is the transition um, that we see in food web structure. And here as we move from south to north, um, sorry, north to south, we see a transition from a copepod and fish-based food web to a, a krill-based food web further south. And key questions are um, what's driving the location of that boundary, uh, where is it, and is it likely to shift over time? So another thing we know um, is that there are regional differences in the relative importance of species in Southern Ocean food webs and also in the structure of those food webs. And this is just an example that from some recent work that we've been doing through the ACRC looking at um, responses of food webs in different regions of the Southern Ocean to environmental change. So what we've done is um, developed a generic representation of an Antarctic food web um, using qualitative network modelling. You might have seen this kind of uh, model before. Filled circles represent a negative effect from one component to another and an arrow is a positive effect. So this is a predator-prey relationship between Antarctic krill and penguins. So we have a range of functional groups at different trophic levels in this model and then we've implemented it for four well-studied regions of the Southern Ocean um, based on existing models in different frameworks. Um, and in these graphs, if you can make out the boxes that have a blue outline or blue arrows, those are components and linkages that are in the generic model but not in the particular implementation. And so what we're doing is using qualitative network analysis to run a series of perturbation scenarios to look at the responses of these food webs to current environmental change and then also environmental change in the future. So these regional differences in um, species and food webs are related to regional differences in habitats. And another key component of our work at the ACRC is trying to develop um, a framework to make assessments of status and trends in habitats and ecosystems, um, and also to make meaningful statements about that, those changes in terms of uh, information that could be useful for policymakers. So we're looking at a suite of habitat variables at the moment. Um, including things like temperature and sea ice. This is an example of uh, remotely sensed chlorophyll A. So the map on the left um, is a summer climatology or long-term mean, and you can see immediately that there's pronounced um, spatial variability. One way of handling that is to consider the Southern Ocean as um, different sectors. And here we have four sectors, um, the Atlantic, the Indian and then the West and East Pacific. And we also have um, a latitudinal division that's based on environmental features. So the numbers on the map are the um, means for chlorophyll A for each of those spatial divisions. Um, and then on the right, we have um, a method for um, capturing both trends over time and also differences in variability between sectors. So the y-axis here is just frequency and then we have log chlorophyll A on the x-axis and we've, we've split the time series into three time slices. Um, if you can make it out, the lightest grey colour is um, the oldest time slice and the solid black is the newest time slice. 
So you can see the trends from the little spark graphs at the top, but importantly, these probability density um, plots are giving us information about patterns of variability at the regional scale and changes over time um, in those patterns, which have meaning in terms of habitats and potential responses of the biology. Um, and then finally, an important question is how might this change in the future? And again, I just um, picked an example. This is some recent work that we've been doing on um, modelling potential habitat for larval krill. Um, so sea ice is a really important habitat for larval krill over the winter. Um, they use it as a food source in terms of the algae that are growing on the underside of the ice. Um, and also probably as a spatial refuge from predation. Um, and so what we did in this work was to use output from a sea ice model and apply <clears throat> a series of filters to try to identify areas where there would be most likely to be food available. Um, and then the overlay, the colour overlay is the degree of ridging, so the spatial complexity of the habitat. Um, and the most interesting thing, well, one of the most interesting things that came out of this work um, is that we actually see, so we have a current climate and a warm climate, we actually see an increase in the area of suitable habitat um, under the warm climate scenario. Um, and that's interesting because um, the general train of thought is that changes in sea ice habitats are likely to have negative effects on krill populations. Um, and this kind of work, I think, helps to identify some of the key uncertainties um, around those kinds of paradigms. So my final question is, um, where are we heading with this in particular, um, in terms of moving towards an observing system for detecting ecosystem change? Um, and I think the, the key questions here are, um, what do we need to measure to give us robust signals of status and trend, and also to enable us to attribute the causes of those changes and um, Andrew Constable will give a presentation around where we're at with um, addressing that question for ecosystems. Um, how do we make it meaningful both in terms of the research community but also for uh, policy and decision makers? How do we coordinate our efforts um, from the perspective of efficiency but also in being able to make um, statements about large-scale ecosystem change and how do we develop and use um, models to give us robust predictions about uh, change in the future? Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you very much.